brought to you by Pfizer. I called Kathleen Stratton at the National Academy of Sciences, who was the chief staffer, and I was asking her about these studies. And I realized during these conversations that none of these people had read any of the science. They were just repeating things that they had been told about the science. And then and they kept saying to me, well, I can't answer that detailed question. You need to talk to Paul Offit. Well, Paul Offit is a vaccine developer who made a $186 million deal with Merck on the rotavirus vaccine. And it would be, it was odd to me that government regulators were saying you should talk to somebody in the industry. It's like if I, you know, I used to talk to EPA people all the time, asking them, what does, what does this provision mean in the permit? Why did you put it in there? And if they said to me, I don't know, why don't you go talk to the coal industry, or it's this lobbyist for the coal industry, and he will tell you what we're doing, I would have been very, you know, puzzled and indignant. Oh, it was weird to me that the, the top regulators in the country were telling me, go talk to somebody who's an industry insider, because we don't understand the science. And when I talked to him, I caught him in a lie. And both of us knew that he was lying. And that, and that both of us recognized that, that he was lying. And at that point, I was... Oh, like, you are. Well, I asked him this question. I said, why is it? At CDC and, and, and every state um, regulator recommends that, um, that pregnant women do not eat tuna fish to avoid the mercury, but that CDC is recommending mercury containing flu shots with huge bolus doses of mercury, I mean massive doses, that pregnant women in every trimester of pregnancy. And he said to me, he said, um, well, Bobby, in this kind of patronizing way, by the way, when I talked to Paul Offit, he started the conversation, he was very enthusiastic, and he said, you know, my, your father was my hero, the reason I got into public service and public health was because I was inspired by your father. So that kind of, you know, I'm susceptible, like anybody else, to kind of that kind of flattery, so I was inclined to like the guy. But then he said, this, I asked him about, how can you be, you know, telling people not to eat blood, to women not to eat tuna fish, but giving them a flu shot that has, you know, these huge doses. And he said, well, Bobby, there are, there's two kinds of mercury. There's a good mercury, and there's a bad mercury. And the minute he said, and I knew there's a different kind of mercury in the vaccines. It's ethyl mercury in the vaccines and methyl mercury in the fish. But I know a lot of, by then you can imagine, I know a lot about mercury. I've been suing people. When you sue somebody, um, you get a PhD in that. You know more than anybody in the world. You have to or you're not going to win your lawsuit. So I knew a lot about mercury. I knew that his argument was not with me, but it was with the periodic tables. Because there's no such thing as a good mercury. And I also knew the history of why he was saying that. Because, you know... If mercury was added to vaccines in a form called thimerosal in 1932. And Eli Lilly, which is a manufacturer, was because people knew then that mercury was horrendously neurotoxic. And mercury is a thousand times more neurotoxic than lead. Well, you would never get, shoot lead into your baby. Why was thimerosal introduced? It was allegedly introduced as a preservative, but it doesn't kill, uh, it doesn't kill, uh, streptococcus or any of the other contaminants you would be worried about. In fact, it kills brain cells at one thirtieth the dose that it takes to kill streptococcus or staphylococcus. Staphylococcus. So it wasn't a good preservative. Why? What NIH admitted to me in 2016, the real reason was there as an adjuvant. An adjuvant is a, a toxic material that they add to dead virus vaccines to amplify the, um, the immune response. So your body, when, when, I mean, this is kind of getting into the weeds, but a live virus vaccine, if they give it to you, it can spread the disease. It can mutate and you can spread the disease. That's why most of the polio today, 70% of the polio today is vaccine polio that came from the vaccines. Um, but, so the regulators expressed a preference for dead virus vaccines. 
The dead virus vaccine, however, will not produce a durable or robust immune response enough to get a license. The way you get a license for a vaccine is showing that you get an antibody response for a certain amount of time and that's a strong antibody response. But the dead virus vaccine won't produce that. The vaccinologists figured out that if you add something horrendously toxic to the vaccine, that your body confuses that toxic product and you add it with the dead antigen, which is the viral particle. The, your body confuses that toxin with the viral particle and gets frightened and mounts this huge, humongous immune response. The next time it sees that virus, it, the, the, the immune response is there. So they, at that point, vaccinologists went around searching around the world to find the most horrendously toxic materials to add to vaccines. And there's a mantra in vaccinology that the more toxic the, the adjuvant, the more robust the immune response. And so that's why toxicologists and vaccinologists don't get along with each other. Because the toxicologists would say to the vaccinologists, well, I understand it gave you your immune response, but then what is the fate of that in your body? Where is it going? Is it being excreted? Is it being lodged in the brain? Is it penetrating the blood-brain barrier? And the, the vaccinologists could not answer those questions and did not want to. So they basically moved the toxicologists out of these, you know, out of the vaccine, whole, the whole vaccine universe. Anyway, what, um, so when it was added in 1932, the industry said, Eli Lilly said, um, well, the reason, because everybody was saying, well, how can you put mercury into a child? Who would do that? And they said, well, it's a different kind of mercury, it's ethyl mercury, and the ethyl mercury is excreted very quickly, so it won't stay in your body. They had no science to say that, but that's what they were saying for years. And then, in 2003, a CDC scientist called Picciaro did a study where he gave tuna sandwiches that were mercury, you know, contaminated to children. And they, and then measured the blood, and the mercury from the tuna sandwich was there a half-life 64 days later. So it was still there 64 days. And he injected the children with mercury from a vaccine, and that mercury disappeared from their blood within a week. And this kind of confirmed what Eli Lilly had said in 1932. Oh, it disappears really quickly from the body. And that was published, I, I believe, in the labs, labs there, pediatrics, but immediately the journal began getting letters from people, including this famous scientist called Dr. Boyd Haley, who is the head of, he's the chair of that chemistry department at the University of Kentucky. And he said, what, but what happened to the mercury? Because Pitcher couldn't find it in the children's urine or in their feces or in their hair or sweat or nails. So where is it? And then and NIH actually then commissioned a study. And they, because they, at that point, they were really trying to figure out, you know, whether this was dangerous. And they commissioned a very famous scientist called Thomas Burbacker up at the University of Washington, Seattle, to do a study with monkeys, with macaques. And he did the same study Pichiero did. But he did something you can't do with children, which he then killed the monkeys. And then he looked for the mercury, and what he found was the mercury, yes, it left their blood immediately. The ethyl mercury from the vaccines was gone from their blood in a week. The methyl mercury from the tuna fish was there two months, a month later, two months later. <clears throat> but when he sacrificed the monkeys and did postmortems, he found that the mercury had not left their body. Instead, the reason it was disappearing from their blood is because Ethyl mercury crosses the blood-brain barrier much easier than mer methyl mercury. The ethyl mercury from the vaccine was going directly to the brains of these animals, and it was lodging there and causing severe inflammation. And, um, and you know, we now know it's there 20 years later. So, um, what, you know, so, the, so when Burba went off and when I'm on the phone with Offit, and I said, he said, the ethyl mercury is extremely quickly, and I said, how do you know that? And he said, because of the Pichiero study. Uh, because the study by, by, by Pichiero found that it was excreted quick in a week. 
And I said, but you're familiar with the Burbacker study. That showed him that it's gone to the brain. And it was dead silence on the phone. And then he said to me, he kind of hemmed it all and said, well, you're right. Uh, it's not that study, it's just a whole mosaic of studies. And I said, can you cite any for me? And he said, I'll send them to you. And he never did. If you're vaccinated, you're not going to be hospitalized, you're not going to be in an ICU unit, and you're not going to die. You're okay. You're not going to, you're not going to get COVID if you have these vaccinations. They're killing people. They are, look, the only pandemic we have is among the unvaccinated. And, that's, and, they're, and they're killing people.